I love how children enjoy Christmas, but sometimes I wonder how much they really understand. A young girl came home from church pretty pumped up and she said, Mummy, my teacher said that I drew the most unusual Christmas picture she has ever seen. Her mother agreed with the teacher. It was strange. Wanting to understand the artwork, but also not to upset her daughter, she gently asked, This is great, but who are all these people riding on the back of the aeroplane? That's the flight into Egypt. Oh, her mother said cautiously, Well, who is this mean-looking man at the front of the plane? And the girl said, that's Pontius, the pilot. And no one can fracture a Christmas carol better than a child, unless it's me. Let's see how well we do with this Christmas carol quiz we'll call What is the Carol? Here's the first one. Give attention to the melodious celestial beings. Got it? Yes, the hark the herald, angels sing. OK, here's the next one. Embellish the entryways. And the answer is... Deck the halls. Try another. Nocturnal noiselessness. That's a favourite, isn't it? Silent night. And just one more. Alas, diminutive settlement in Israel. And that's another favourite. O little town of Bethlehem. And today we will take a few moments to focus on Bethlehem, the place where Jesus was born and much of the action took place. Micah predicted, You, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old from ancient times. And Matthew 2 is the fulfilment. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. Now, I've been to Bethlehem, and it wasn't an easy journey. There was a riot on the road and my driver reversed at speed to get away from the stone throwing. The place didn't seem very special, but it was. And let's not miss the miracle happening when Mary and Joseph made their way to this small town and Jesus was born because King Herod's advisers missed it. Oh, they could tell the visiting Magi, yes, there is a prediction that a special king will be born in Bethlehem in Judea, but they didn't make the trip with them, and they missed it. You know, Bethlehem has a checkered past. Bethlehem continues to have mixed messages, but it sends out to the world in its politics and in its creeds and in its violences all sorts of mixed messages, doesn't it? But don't miss out on God's message to us through his choice of Bethlehem as the birthplace for Jesus. You see, we all need a sense of wonder about our lives. We don't want to settle for the boring and the mundane, do we? I was born under a wandering star, says the song in an old show, Paint Your Wagon. Where am I going? I don't know. When will I get there? I ain't certain. I only know that I'm on my way. That's a signature tune 
for a lot of people, isn't it? We talk about progress, but we don't know where we're going. But there is a star that the Magi followed that settled over Bethlehem, pointing out the one who was born to make a difference for us. We're all seeking wonder. That is a sense of value and what makes life worth living. And we need something outside of ourselves to meet that need because anything within us will only take us as far as our abilities and fortunes can go. And ultimately we die. And given time, no one will be grieving. No one will be thinking about us at all. That's life. Or better put, that's death. So consider Bethlehem and the wonder of what happened. Grasping this helps us find purpose for our lives that doesn't end at a grave. Let me give you the reasons why we will never be the same again if we grasp this. First, Bethlehem tells us that God pays attention to detail. We may forget details, but God never does. And God promised through Micah the Saviour would be born in Bethlehem. So it was. God knew that we would make a mess of our lives and need help. His intention was always to step down into human history, taking human flesh, making himself visible and vocal. Do we want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus. God promised action on our behalf and he doesn't forget. Do you ever feel that God has forgotten you? Do you ever feel that your prayers are going nowhere? A boy was getting ready for bed. His mum and grandmother were with him as he was quietly saying his prayers as instructed. Dear God, please bless mummy and daddy. Suddenly, he raised his voice. And please, may I have a new bike for Christmas? His mum said, don't shout. God isn't deaf. And he said, no, but grandma is. And does it seem that God is deaf to our cry? Maybe we've been praying about something for a long time and if God isn't deaf, maybe he's indifferent. It's hard to keep going in the face of such a thought. Beirut hostages Tom Sutherland and Terry Anderson sat bound to a wall in near total darkness for six years. Tom Sutherland said that you worry that you've been forgotten and abandoned. They would try to listen to the guards' radio and never heard their names. When released, Tom's wife was flown to be with him and they made the journey home to America. Disembarking from the plane, there were lots of media lights and cameras. Turning to his wife, he said, It looks like there has been a celebrity on the plane with us. Look at all the media attention. She said, it's for you. Later he said, I thought nobody cared. Thank God I was wrong. And thank God we are wrong if we think that God is indifferent to our cries. Bethlehem tells us that God doesn't forget not one part of his word gets unfulfilled. Thank God we're wrong. We are loved and the proof is Bethlehem. God didn't forget where his son was to be born. And he won't forget our prayer. He won't forget us. God doesn't forget about the empty place in our hearts. Talk to him about that incident in your life when you were a child that's impacting how you relate to people now. Talk to him about your adult children who have drifted away from God and it's been so long. Talk to him about that fact that you're still single and you're the marrying type. Talk to him about your loneliness. God has not forgotten you. 
realize what a miracle this is. God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. By his spirit, he is here now and he knows all about us. That's what Bethlehem says to us. God really does pay special attention to the details. Secondly, Bethlehem tells us that God plans action on time. A decision made in Rome sent every man to his home location for a census. That took Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem at just the right time, as Paul wrote. When the time had fully come, God sent his son. Micah was a contemporary of Isaiah. And Micah's prophecy has been called Isaiah in miniature because it has the same theme. Isaiah knew that a virgin would conceive. Micah knew that it would be in Bethlehem. Isaiah had royal connections. Micah was from a rural background, probably known to his friends as Mike. His prophecy begins, The word of the Lord came to Micah of Moresheth. We don't know his father's name, but we do know that he was the right man in the right place at the right time. You know, often God's best gifts come slowly and the growth and strength in waiting are often outcomes greater than the end so longed for. Paul had time to realise this as he lay in prison. Jesus himself experienced delay in the silent years before his great public ministry began. God wants us to see results as we work for him, but his first concern is our growth. That's why God often withholds success until we've learned patience. And we learn this through delays. So the Magi made their Star Trek and they didn't meet Jesus in a stable. By this time, Jesus was in a house. But get the point. They came at the right time. They were not there just because of the star, but because it pointed to a king. How did they know? They had listened to Daniel. The word magistrate comes from the word magi. And this religious group had enormous clout in the political field. Magi were the highest ranking officials in Babylon. And Daniel becomes the chief of the Magi. And he is probably why they are in this story. Why else would people travel hundreds of miles from the east to come to Bethlehem to find the king of the Jews? Unless a Jewish prophet had tipped them off. I think it's directly to the influence of Daniel. Guided by God at the right time, Jesus came. Sometimes we feel time is running out for us. We want our prayers answered by Thursday, preferably last Thursday. Please know, if God seems to be holding out on you, it's because he has something better in mind. Trust him for that. And Bethlehem, at just the right time, you will be the focus of attention. Do you know there are probably 332 predictions in our Bible about the first coming of Jesus? An incredible number. His timing is always right. This is a promise from God directing the events causing Jesus to be born in Bethlehem. And God hasn't forgotten us. But God is not in a hurry. God's way is rarely the quickest or easiest, but it's always the best. And this brings us to the third lesson as a cause for wonder. Bethlehem tells us that God picks out the insignificant. Did you know that there were two Bethlehems? 
The smallest was F. Rafa. I've preached at a church in Hollywood. That's Hollywood, Birmingham, England. But America is where minds will go unless I clarify, right? That is what they did in Micah's day too. So God takes a little place and makes something of it, the smaller of the two Bethlehems. And this is a theme of scripture. Miss this and we miss a lot. God always does great things with small things. It's all there through the scriptures. David with Goliath, the little man with a handful of stones against the big man, well armed. Others were saying, he's so big we can't win against him. Young David said, he's so big I can't miss him. And then there's Mary, Jesus' mother, just an ordinary peasant girl. And God picks her out. Do you feel weak? You will. And feel life is over now for you. God will fill up what you lack. So you have a small faith. But you do have a faith in God, don't you? God will do great things. You see, it's not the size of our faith as much as the person we are putting our faith in. It's not what we are believing, but whom. Nothing is impossible with God. A little is a lot in the hands of God. Our little moments are precious to God. The little times we take with him, the moments we invest in worship, the moments we give to our children and grandchildren for the Lord, the money that we give for the gospel, none of it is lost. God brings those events together for good. Even the bad things God can and will make work together for his good purposes. Never think... Oh, this is such a small matter. God won't be interested in answering this. Who are we to say that there is anything big to God? Everything is small to him. So, cast your cares, small or big in our eyes, upon him because he cares for you. And here's another very significant wonder we get from God's choice of Bethlehem. God provides for our needs. Those shepherds would usually be preparing sheep for sacrifice at the nearby Jerusalem temple. People knew that they couldn't have personal dealings with God if there was a barrier between them and God. And sin does that to us. It separates us now and it will separate us from God eternally unless something is done about it. Note this scripture about Jesus and let it impact us. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. Those men who were caring for the sacrificial lambs, were presented with God's sacrificial lamb, dying that we might be forgiven and find permanent access to God. And Jesus met needs as the bread and water of life. He said this when teaching in Jerusalem. There had been a ceremony with water when the people were longing for someone special to come who would be the water of life for them. Listening to Jesus and knowing what he had done, people asked, how can the Christ come from Galilee? Does not the scripture say that the Christ will come from David's family and from Bethlehem? the town where David lived, but they didn't check it out. The teachers instructing the Magi about the location of the king didn't follow it up and walk just a few miles from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. And it happened again. They doubted Jesus' credentials because they didn't check them out. 
And this happens today. There are reasons for our hope in Jesus, but we need to check the facts. Philip Brooks was a preacher during the time of the American Civil War. When the war was over and Lincoln was shot, the nation wanted Brooks to preach. After the funeral, he was exhausted and needed rest. He went to the Holy Land travelling by horse to Bethlehem for Christmas Day. He looked at the sky and thought of it lighting up with the brightness of the angels bringing the message to the shepherds. Two years later, as he planned a Christmas programme, there was the need for a special song. Did he remember his visit that day? This was his first verse. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie above thy deep and dreamless sleep. The silent stars go by, yet in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. And if we are feeling needy, Bethlehem was the house of bread, and Jesus is the bread of life. He will give us what we need. Go to Christ. We are not forgotten. He knows the details of our lives. He takes small things and makes great things. Trust the bread of life, born in Bethlehem. And why a manger in Bethlehem? Easy. It gave accessibility. Anyone can come. People like shepherds, back then the lowest class of society. Bethlehem is the place where God's great gift to us began in flesh. It's the best gift ever. And I want to add one more fact about what was happening at Bethlehem when Jesus entered the world. And this is something we may overlook, but we will never be the same if we grasp this. God produces gifts for Jesus. Yes, the Magi gave gifts to Jesus, and this is a time when we give gifts to one another. But when it comes to giving gifts, have you ever thought of yourself as a gift to Jesus. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, it was the start of people all over the world becoming a gift to him. Think about this. We may have read the prayer Jesus prayed and overlooked what he said. Before his crucifixion, 17 times, Jesus uses the words give, gave, or given. Jesus praying to the Father said, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me. So we are a gift to Jesus. We may say, I've given my life to Christ on this day, at this place, at this hour. I gave my life to Christ. That's from earth's perspective. From heaven's perspective, when we come to him, God gives our life to Christ. Sometimes people will say, who do you think you are? God's gift to the world? Next time answer, no, I don't. I actually think I'm God's gift to Jesus Christ. And you are. Every redeemed person is a gift the Father gives to Jesus. And he can because Jesus paid the price for that gift. So, back to Bethlehem. When the angels showed up, what were they doing in the skies? They were praising Christ. How were they praising Christ? Most people say that they were singing, right? 
After all, the Christmas carol says, Hark the herald angels sing. In fact, in the entire Bible, there are only two times when we could possibly say that angels sang. And Bethlehem is not one of them. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, not singing, but saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men on whom his favour rests. But that would mess up the Christmas carol, wouldn't it? Hark the herald angels speak. Just twice in the Bible it says angels sang before creation and its fall, as Job says. And in Revelation, after the curse on the earth has been removed, so the only time the angels are singing is before the fall and after the curse is lifted. It's as if they are restrained from singing while the curse is on the earth. And they minister in silence, though they certainly speak in their praise. So where does the singing come from? us. We are the redeemed. We are not angels. You may look good, but you're not angels. And the Bible tells us over and over again that we should be singing songs of redemption. You say, well, I don't have a good voice. Then give it back to God. Break the silence and sing the carols from the bottom of our heart. Bethlehem also marks the place where we become the gift that God the Father gave to his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We gave our life to Jesus and God gave us to Jesus. And one day God will give us to his heaven to adorn for eternity. By the way, the angels over Bethlehem said, Peace to men on who his favour rests. We don't see a lot of peace on earth. Literally it means peace to the people that God is well pleased with. When we make peace with God through Jesus Christ, he fills us with the peace we cannot get anywhere else. That's offered to us as a gift this Christmas. If you have not received him personally, please do so. And I want any of you who are discouraged by whatever is going on in your life and you feel like God's timing is way off and you're saying, God, you're late. No, you may be early. You may be looking at the wrong clock because God is on time. And if God would go through all of this intricate plan to send his son from heaven to earth, don't you think that he has got us covered? Do we think anything is slipping through his fingers at this point in our life? Do we have any right to pull out our hair and go, I'm worried? What? Perfect timing, perfect plan, perfect person, perfect reasoning behind all that is about. So this is a good time for us to lay down our worry, lay down our burden and start trusting Him.